we're just kind of going to go through kind of the history from how we started to where we are today. That's kind of the general broad stroke of where we are. This up here just to show kind of where I grew up. I grew up in Midtown Manhattan. Uh, that was uh, I grew up on the 10th floor up there. Uh, and these are some of the milestones for kind of my entry to California. I came out here in '98, and in 2011 we opened up this shop that you're sitting in right now, January 2011, and uh, we converted to our co-op uh, July of last year. So those are kind of the timeline of where we are. Yeah. What? Like, did you pizza? Did you do something in New York related to it? Or? I'm just a consumer. I'm a tech guy. I don't have any food service background or any restaurants background. Um, I was always looking for um, a place where I thought I could get a good slice of pizza. And I couldn't find it in California for upwards of eight plus years, so I decided I'd just kind of do it myself. So, what do BMW and NBC have to do with it? Uh, that's where I, I worked oh, okay. when in New York. <laughs> yeah, so those are some of the things that where I worked back 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 home. Um, and uh, you know, so pizza's not just a business for me; it's it's a personal passion of mine. It's just something I grew up with. It's my comfort food. Uh, so it's something I'm personally passionate about. Uh, not necessarily how to run a restaurant. That's not my. That's not why I got into this. Um, like I said, I'm a consumer. I know what the end product needs to look like, and that's why we, we did what we did. Fine. Uh, <clears throat> okay, so uh, the employee ownership part, that was the next thing kind of on the agenda is, you know, why sell to employees? What's, what's, why, why did you do that? Uh, when I talk to people, uh, I get the comment, um, why are you giving your business away? You know, and, and that tells me that there's a, such a clear misunderstanding about what it is that we're trying to do here in terms of changing the discussion. So um, I just I, I put these up. These are just kind of uh, go through um, when I uh, when I was in in New York. I was at NBC, which is owned by GE, and out here at Cisco. Um, they had a culture of employee ownership. They always gave stock to their employees. And even though it was like this much stock, um, there was always uh, the notion that you had ownership in a company. It was part of, you know, the decisions you make affect the bottom line to some, to some degree. And uh, whether it's stock options, being empowered to make things, having bonuses, rewarding top performers, being number one, number two in your industry were always mantras that GE and Cisco both help. Cisco is almost like a like a mini GE, uh, the way I would look at it when I came um, out here. They shared very similar uh, goals and strategies and, and how they approach things. Um, but the number one thing that both companies, or, you know, those, those corporate structures had is they, they prioritize their employees. Uh, the culture of um, Having employees come first was really a uh, problem. Now, maybe not today, but when I when I was there, that was that was what I took away uh, typically as um, what is important to the business, and it's it's all about the people. Uh, and so that's something that stuck with me uh, very strongly and and resonated with me. So that's something that I've always prioritized in, in my organizations that I ran in these companies, um, as well as as here. Uh, so again, all about the people. That, I think dovetails with what the cooperative culture is all about. So the conversion process. We, um, I don't think we ever would have been able to do something like this without help from somebody. I don't think I would venture, I would not recommend somebody try and do it on their own, just say, yeah, go figure it out. Yeah, I think that's a recipe for disaster. Um, so we partnered with Project Equity. Uh, they're new to this uh, kind of industry and uh, profession as a professional organization, but they have a lot of experience in worker cooperatives. Uh, and uh, when I reached out to, I think I originally reached out to Paolo, um, who reached out to David Smathers, who connected me with David Smathers more, who then connected me with Dowie, who then forwarded me off to Hillary, or introduced me to Hillary. And at the time, Hillary was going through a process where they're just starting their incubator program to incubate um, cooperative you know, conversions. And I'm like, well, I'm all about trying to help businesses figure things out too. Well, we're figuring it out, you're figuring it out, let's figure it out together. And so that's kind of what, what, why we landed with Project Equity. And they 
uh, you know, we went with Niles Pie as the company that also was in our incubator program. They're up in, um, uh, I'm not sure what city they're in, but they're just north. East Bay? In the East Bay. But the, in Niles, it's the Niles Alvarado exit off of uh, Fremont. In Fremont, yes. yes. Um, and uh, they, you know, we went through this process. Yeah, they're, they're a smaller organization than ours. Um, and frankly, they, uh, we, 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 we obviously convert at the same time. We, we both converted in July, but we took a little bit different path on how we converted. Um, we were uh, a little more structured. We had a, a legal team that helped us convert. We had a professional accounting firm that helped us do this. So we spent a, a professional accounting uh, organization, which we, you know, a lot of this comes from Ares Mendy. We think Ares Mendy is probably the gold platinum standard, if you will, um, for worker cooperatives, and we would love to be able to emulate everything they do. Um, and Wegner CPAs, are, they're out of Wisconsin. Uh, it seems to be who people use in the cooperative industry. They know that business. So we stuck with them. We're working on trying to reinvent that wheel. So uh, between, we had, I think, three different legal teams work through this with us. One, um, uh, Tuttle is, is one with Sushil, which is great. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, we also uh, worked with um, uh, Sarah and uh, I'm, I'm blanking on the name of the um, uh, Sarah Selk. Kaplan. Selk. Yeah, Sarah, who works for Selk. Um, and I'm blanking what Selk stands for. Sustainable Sustainable Economies Law. Law. Thank, Thank you. you. Yeah. So that organization. So we had that organization as well as Sarah, as her person, she works for them but in, in her capacity as a nonprofit, but then also has her own practice. So we engaged her private practice as well. So um, we spent, we wanted to spend a fair amount of time researching things that we could use and make available, not just for us, but for others as well. And we learned um, a lot in this process uh, and we, 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 we originally started, we had, had what we call our business development team, and we had about 14 people, uh, mem uh, uh, workers, uh, meet Sunday mornings, almost weekly, so we used to every other week, sometimes weekly, on Sunday morning, which is our private time, and we open up late Sunday, we open up at 1 o'clock on Sunday, so these guys would come in 9, 30, 10 o'clock, and we would meet for two, two and a half hours to talk about how can we turn our business into an employee-owned business. And we didn't have a, a structure or a way to do that at the time. This was three years ago. And, um, and we, we, we spent upwards of probably 12 months going through that process with our team, and maybe even a little more. And then when we found a path that would actually deliver on our goals of employee ownership, then we took four of those people and put them into this program in the incubator. So there were six of us that met uh, monthly with Project Equity, sometimes more, uh, to go through this process. And, and so the first year with the 14 or so, you, yeah. um, you weren't connected with Project Equity at that time? Not at all. So what, or I guess it doesn't matter. No, no. Well, I'm just curious, how did, what were you using to think about it? We were, we were, we were basic, I, I put out to, the, to our group, our team, and basically said, we want to be able to define what an employee-owned business is with you. And so like sort I, of what that end product is. <coughs> yeah, we started with the, the goal. The goal is we want to have this to be employee-owned. The process is I don't know how to do that. I don't have the cycles personally to figure it out. So if we want to figure this out together, let's do that. And initially it was like, yeah, sounds good. And then I got very little take up on that. And so at our, at our meeting, uh, I think it was the three Christmases ago, or two and a half Christmases ago, um, I basically said, I said, look, I said, I've been in business upwards of 20 plus years in the professional industry. I said, not, I can tell you with absolute certainty, not one of my employers, owners, has ever offered me to try and figure out how to make the business employee owned. Not one. I've never had anybody approach me with that, never had anyone discuss that with me, and if you don't want to do that, that's fine. I'm not holding a gun to your head saying you got to do this. But if you want to do that, you need to participate. And so I had them, I said, anybody who's interested, here's a form, sign this. And you're going to agree that at least monthly, if not multiple times monthly, we are going to get together and talk about it. And if you don't want to, that's fine. But 
the offer's on the table for you guys if you want to do that. And I, at the time, there was like 14 or 15 people signed that. So you that, offered it to everybody. Were there other people right. that like, left? Uh, well, there were other people that didn't want to get involved or couldn't get involved or whatever. They and just kind of lingering after that. Yeah, so this was during during me. I, I could kind of put that out as part of a company meeting, and uh, and we got a lot of you know that was kind of my look. If you want to do this, let's take it seriously. I'm not going to screw around. Uh, you know, I'm not going to I'm not going to waste my. If you guys aren't interested, I, I'm not going to waste my time figuring it out for you. You know, this is an opportunity for you, and I'm only interested in people that are interested in that opportunity to engage in. So we had a lot of interest, and um, so to, at these meetings, did people actually like go home with assignments? Like, I'm going to research this, or I'm going to research. So we, we did, well, and we had a couple people, and 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 it was because of one of the assignments that someone had, who she's not actually with the business anymore. Uh, she picks up a shift here and there, but she's got her professional career uh, that she's doing now. Um, she actually uh, saw the work of ICA. Um, and some of the papers and brought that as an idea. I mean, there was basically two. What's you, ICA? Um, and I don't know what it stands for, they're on the East Coast, but they're a national yeah. organization. And actually the person at Dawi that we met with, um, she is now at ICA. And I don't know what ICA, do you know what ICA? Uh, well, they've been around for a number of years. They do consulting on co-ops and they actually put out materials and templates and ideas. Of how Great material, see, yeah. I mean really good material. They've been around for a couple decades, I think. I mean a while. And um, and they, they do similar work to what Project Equity does. But Project Equity is local and new, and they have a very focused mission, right? I think ICA is maybe a little bit broader. Um, but we met with, you know, when she got this research and brought it to us, there's basically, we either have this kind of stock plan or this, you know, e ESOP, which seemed a little confusing, which we couldn't even figure out how to wrap our heads around, or you have a work cooperative model. And we, brought that forth to, at, 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 at the next Christmas, basically, the next Christmas holiday party we had, we brought that and she presented uh, this information, and that's when we started following up and researching how to do that, and I think probably four months later is when we engaged with uh, Project Equity. So Because uh, you, just, you didn't know about Project Equity at the time? I don't know if Project Equity even existed back then. They were pretty, they're relatively new, they're like two, three years old. Um, and so we engaged them just over two years ago, I think. Mean, roughly. Yeah. Can you remember the moment, or let us say, what planted the seed of the idea to do this? Um, it was present from day one when we opened up our business. Yeah. Literally day one. And when I talked to our corporate attorney, because you know we have a corporate attorney for all the documents and legal stuff that we had to do, I told him, I said, how can I do some kind of stock plan? Because that was always a priority for me starting this business. He's like, you can't do a stock plan. There is no way to do that. You don't have any assets. This is an industry that people come and go all the time. You cycle through. People are going to steal from you. Do this, that, the other thing. No one is not set up for this. You're going to set expectations. It's going to be a big failure. Don't do it. Not advisable. And basically shut it down. And so, I mean, I'm new to this industry. I'm new to this world. And so I said, okay. Uh, we're, 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 we'll just, we've always done uh, annual bonuses. I do performance reviews, annual reviews. Um, spot bonuses, so we had ways to incent people, kind of like profit sharing, but not officially called profit sharing. Uh, it was just completely discretionary. Um, but we did it in a way that would reward performance and and we and, and merit, not just because you've been working here, but you know these merit, merit increases um, and, and and annual bonuses. And some people um, that worked here never even heard of a bonus; they didn't even know what a bonus was. Uh, and they never had one before, so we got to introduce some of the things that we liked about corporate world and stuff that we didn't like about corporate world, we made sure we got rid of that and, and, didn't, and didn't include that. Um, so that's when it started. So, if, frankly, if, if the attorney that we worked with back then in 2005 knew about cooperatives, you know, might, might have been a little different. I don't know if we would have started that way because, I, frankly, I need a little more control. I'm not a control freak, but I like to be able to do things the way I think is needs to be done to get things started, and uh, I, but I, we would have it would have been part of the plan to begin with if they knew this, and and if you know even our, the current uh, attorneys that are out there they don't know what this is all about they don't have a clue, um, so I I don't think they're able to recommend or even guide any of their clients in this direction, 
And it's just, it's so, that's, so part of, so there's two outputs from going through this process with Project Equity. One is to actually do the conversion. That was one of our outputs. But the other... And don't you think that converting it probably was an easier thing? Because you have information about what the business is doing already. Um, like, to some degree, uh, sure. Uh, there, there's, there's money to help convert and fund that process. Um, but I, I, and I don't know if it's easier to start off with a shared value system of how you're going to operate, and then everyone's bought in day one and has that kind of expectations that like you're going to work your ass off. Right. So there the might beginning. be pros and cons. Yeah. So I, I can't say. I think you know it's like what they say. It's like it's like uh, every co-op's like a snowflake. Everyone's unique. Yeah. Uh, and I think and that's and that's true. But one of the, the other out output besides doing the actual conversion, the other output that is very important to me is to have basically a, a little slide deck that I could have sit down with a small business owner for 20 or 30 minutes and explain what a worker cooperative is, the process we went through, the decisions we made and why we made them, and let them decide for themselves if it's something that they thought was a good idea for them. And so I haven't, I don't have that slide deck in, in, in its totality because life gets in the way and I don't get to create stuff like that. But I have a, a, a basic message and flow that I can go with. It's just not as tight as I would like it. But that's one of the things that's very important to me is to try and, um, you know, frankly advocate for this type of, of infrastructure to be out there and have choices for people. So that's really important to me. Now, kind of the lessons, lessons learned here of the conversion process. Uh, uh, I think it took longer than it should for, in general, you know, here's something that the owners were trying to push and drive and it still took 12 months, right? So if it's not something that's clear and the owner's like, so what am I doing and how, why am I spending 20 grand and 30 grand to do this stuff or what am I, you know, it's going to be even slower. So the fact that it takes that much time and it costs that much money is a problem. And that we got fixed. So what we are trying to do is we, we spent more time up front on our side to create documents. Like um, one of the things that's really important for at least our business is is uh, tips, right? Tips adds about dollar fifty to two dollars an hour per per employee per per shift, right? So making sure that this didn't in any way get in the way of people being able to get uh, paid while they're here was really important. And because we're set up as an LLC, we use the LLC legal structure to, to, to drive this. Um, in the laws of the, in the eyes of the law, people be, could be considered managers. And management are not allowed to have tips, period. Starbucks got into a whole bunch of problems with that uh, in, in doing so. So we actually spent, I'm gonna say, you know, the lawyers that we have, their seal's great, but they're not cheap. They're three, three fifty an hour um, to, to, to run this. And this is, and that's like, you know, we got, I think we gave us a, a reduced rate, right? So this is, no one, this is, don't misunderstand. This is, lawyers are still, lawyers are still lawyers, right? And so same with the accountants. Accountants are three fifty an hour too. Everybody's expensive. Um, so, but the benefit is, is these guys are experts, and hopefully their time is 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 minimized and not learning. But in this case, we're learning. He was learning on some of the things that I was pushing for because he didn't know about the tip law. So we pushed him to do the research. So he we probably spent you know three grand on that document. It's a four page document, but it clearly identifies what the legal balances that you can choose to do and how to set up your organization to make sure that worker owners are not um, impacted by the law. Right, so, and, that, and that's something you could pass on to someone. Absolutely. So that and, uh, and all the other stuff that we put together, our, our policies and procedures, our operating agreement, we want to be able to offer that so someone has a starting point. So they can have, um, you know, it's not going to be turnkey, here you go, but maybe it's 75% to get you started, 80%, 85% to get a lot of the documentation so then you can start tweaking the variables on, and plug in what's important to you. That's really important for us to, to be able to make it easier. Because if it's 12 months and 50 grand, it's never going to happen. Are you so, going to charge for this? No. So you're at some point going to have a package of information that is available for yeah. other restaurant owners? Yeah, for anybody, yeah. Or, I'm trying to. I mean, we, we have bits and like pieces. It yeah. would, you know, be more relevant to restaurant owners. Maybe yeah. Not, but. 
I mean, I don't, I don't, I don't think it's necessarily restaurant owners. It's, 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 it's any. It's this is organizational stuff. Whether you're selling shoes or electronics or, uh -huh. or pizza, except for the tip thing. Yeah. Except for the tip thing. Um, but everything else is the fundamentals are the same. But in the in, in the in the food service industry, the tipping thing is a big deal. Yeah. Uh, because so I didn't want to exactly yeah. understand that. So yeah. there's a way to create it so that all the employees are considered managers and they don't get tips and there's tips aren't involved. So so when you're a, so you you can set up without getting too much detail about LLC structure, you can set it up as member managed or manager managed, and then uh, officers of the company are considered members and managers. So how do you differentiate between a manager at a you know state federal level versus what um, the employment you know EDD development department expects from managers participating in the tip pool? They're 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 different functions. So we made it very clear when we define our operating agreement what those roles are and the fact that just because you're a member manager of the LLC does not make you a manager of the organization. I'm the only manager. The general manager is the only manager in the company, uh -huh. period. So that's how we defined it to make it very, very clear that even though these guys may be managers on paper for the business, they have nothing to do with managing the operations so they qualify for tipping. Oh. That, that, some, in summary, it's four pages. Yeah. But that's sort of yeah. three and a half pages. But that's the net result of it. It allows that to be very clear and distinct. Um, but you have to define. You have to be. So none of this stuff's complicated. I mean, it's a little confusing, but it's not super complicated. You just have to be very, very clear about what you're trying to do. And the beauty of it is, is our guys built the operating room. Our our bylaws, our you know constitution for our business was designed and built by our guys. So they decided what they wanted to commit to, and to me that was very important because they have complete buy-in on the process. So if you don't like that, don't put it in there. If you do, we'll put it in there, then you gotta stick to it. Don't just say arbitrarily decide you don't want to abide by it. Um, so again, it took longer uh, than it should, it was expensive, um, but the other thing that we did is uh, we had complete transparency on everything. Our books are completely open. And the thing that really struck me um, at one of our project equity meetings up in Oakland, um, they brought in Arizmendi uh, to present. And so Arizmendi, they have, I don't know, like half a dozen or a dozen locations. Um, some of the locations are bigger than others. Uh, the bigger one, I, I don't know if it was a San Francisco one or a Berkeley one, they came in and he basically put up his, you know, chart of accounts on the screen. Six million dollar business. Right, and he put everything up there. I mean, everything: cost of goods, labor, expenses. He even showed the capital accounts uh, for you know the member accounts, named accounts in there, and what the balances were. I mean, we're talking. And I, at that point, I wasn't even comfortable sharing that level of information from my own with my own guys because it's I mean it's sensitive information. And, and this guy, he's like, he doesn't know who we are. We're nobody's to him. Right, and, and, and he comes in and shares it with 30 people, I was blown away. So that, to me, was a tipping point for me to say, look, you're either in or you're not. You gotta be all in in transparency. So our books are completely open. Um, I started to share that before that, but not at that level. Now it's, it's at, at, it was at, at that point forward, it was at all levels. So, were they presenting just to you guys or to the They were presenting company? to the Project Equity. They were, at that point, there were three different companies that were in the room. There was probably 20-something people in the room. Stranger, he never met any of us before. I don't even know if he met Hillary before. Uh -huh. they, they, just, they invited them in, and because cooperatives support each other, that's one of their missions, is to help other cooperatives. They didn't even think twice. And he just said, sure, of course we'll be there. And then they shared their books of, the, of their most valuable d division of Ares Mendy's paper. Well, who are you talking about? Here's, uh, Here's, about Tim? Or it wasn't Tim. Oh. No, it was some other guy who I'd never met. Oh. It was just a guy. Somebody from it was some of Ares Mendy. And then all the books were on the, on the screen. I'm like, really? I mean, you're just going to share all that information? It's like, because it, it, it just, it doesn't, it doesn't matter when you run your business in a way that's equitable, it doesn't, you're not hiding anything. There's nothing too high. Mm -hmm. yeah. And, you know, frankly, even for customers, I mean, customers need to understand where the money, people think that, you know, owners, you know, they carve off all this money and they screw everybody else and they're ripping customers. It's not how it works. And, and people need to understand that. And so I think that's a way to do it, is complete transparency. So we're very, very, um, very clear on everything that we do is open and transparent. And we're open with all of it.
but at where in your process were you when you went to this Sarah's mandate presentation? We were in the project equity conversion process probably three, four months in. Do, like does Project Equity do that um, still? Do they oh, yeah. have incubators? Yeah. So would they I, don't, I think they have, I don't know how many people are in their incubator program at a time. They have between, I think at the time it was up to four. They don't want more than that because it gets too confusing. Um, but I, I, they're still doing it. And that's what their business is. Yeah, I think some of these projects, like the, there was also a co-op academy that ran in, um, something like 12 week program both in classroom. The Project Equity was a major trainer part of that. Yeah. But they couldn't get the same funding for the next years. So some of the newness is these groups sometimes have an incubator program for one or two classes, but then sometimes shift priorities so it's um, they're not continually expanding. They're sort of picking areas uh, to build and some take off and some they, they still try to do fundraising to continue some of these training programs. Yeah. Well and and they they are um, they learn from our experience as well. Right? They're continually evolving their processes. So it was important for them to, you know, get feedback from us. What did we like? What 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 are our takeaways? How can we make the process better? And one of the things is around financial viability and analysis, doing that right up front. So not not something that happens uh, at the end of the process when you're, when, you're, when, you're, when you're going through, but you're actually looking at right up front saying, here's what we think we can do, here's, here, here's what the numbers look like, and let's, let, let's look at, at, at what this is going to look like financially, and then we'll go through this other stuff. But to go through this other stuff and then potentially find out that viability isn't reality, that's, that's a problem. So I think they, they reach in that right You yeah. mentioned the firm Wagner. 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 W-E-G-N-E-R, Wagner, Wagner CPA, yeah. What, what services do they perform? They're accounting. They are accounting. They're oh, accountants, so yeah. they taught you how all the formulas behind all those. They didn't teach me jack. They do it all. <laughs> they do it all? <laughs> they do the accounting. So we provide the books. They helped us make sure our, our, our GL and our, our chart of accounts are, are, are correct. We gave them our old ones. And, and they basically said, okay, well, add this and change this around, and we got to create capital accounts for your for patronage and stuff like that. But other than that, you know, it was, you know, if you have a running business, you have a chart of accounts. They just made sure it was compatible. Are they local or back Wisconsin? Wisconsin. Yeah. Okay. For some reason, everybody. Is, well, I don't I've, know why. I've, I've met these professionals at West Coast co-op conferences. There's a, a lot of co-ops in the Midwest and yes. there's more established firms is, uh, and they realize very they're going to get business around the country because locally there, there isn't enough in the West Coast to keep up with the kind of movement. Yeah, uh, and it's like if, if they already have their expertise, why mess around? Right. I, I mean, there's, you know, it's great that if other people want to come up to speed, I, I'm not going to spend the, I'm not going to spend that resource on trying to figure that one out. That's to me is a outsource. Outsource accounting, outsource legal. I mean, I, you know, that's why. <laughs> Do you have a question too? Yeah. Or? Well, I was just, just wondering when you look back on it. I mean, because of the complexity and the costs, and then and then the risk you're talking about viability. Do you think that that this is, is probably the not only like the best means, the only way to go is to establish it as a as a, as a regular you know, private business first, because because then you have a you know established. Model that, that, that is compatible with kind of the, the overall capital system, and then and then you prove viability uh, as a private business, and then you do the conversion. So to take that as a, yeah, yeah, I, I think there's I think there's benefits to both mm -hmm. both both approaches, and it depends on the type of business, and it depends on the makeup of people. It really it's, it's all about the people. Mm -hmm. they, businesses don't exist without people. It doesn't matter what the business is, and. Uh, depending on you know where you are in that cycle, it might make sense to start it off as a private entity and then turn it into something like that, or it might make sense to start it off as a, a collaborative basis. The, the challenge is uh, that I can see at the beginning is you need to make decisions rapidly when you're starting a business and make decisions um, you know maybe not in a democratic way, but to make decisions because they need to be made to get something accomplished um, and. When, and in a cooperative design, by definition, your board dictates potentially the direction of a company and, uh, and, and could be fairly absolute on that. 
So there's a risk in doing that uh, with that kind of consensus approach. So uh, for startups, again, it depends on, I, I don't want to say one's better than the other. I think it's just different. It depends on the business, it depends on the people, it depends on the, on the market. I, I think there's a lot of variables that go into that. Um, we did this. Uh, because you know, we drove this, and, and frankly, we didn't care about the financial viability. We want to do this no, no matter what the numbers came out of at. And uh, one of the things that was always frustrating to me is coming up with evaluation. Valuations are something that I think are pretty arbitrary, and they look at comps and look at, like housing is the most typical way to look at valuations. Like, well, what are the comps on your block? What just sold, right? Well, that's fine when you have a commodity like a house. But when you have a business that has a level of uniqueness and, and specialization, comps aren't really relevant unless you're like a McDonald's. If you're McDonald's or Burger King, yeah, sure, compare the other McDonald's or Burger King and get comps for that in the area. But if you're a unique business with a unique message and, and design, comps aren't anything. And you talk, when people do comps, they look at national averages, they look at Bay Area, this and that, and there's, there's no value placed necessarily on what the business does. And, but the people that work there, they know, the, they know what we do. They know why we do what we do. Um, so uh, it was important for us to go through this process, and either way, we were going to go through no matter what that viability was. And the, the message of valuation wasn't a matter of comps. We decided, it's like, let's look at what the business can afford. And whatever the business can afford, then that's what its value is. I don't care if its comp is 100000 or $8 million. If the business can afford $300,000, then that's what it's going to sell for, right? Period. And that's what, that, because that's what it can afford. And so we did it, one of the things that we did, and I don't know if I talk about this, I don't think I do. Um, uh, it's a little bit more detailed, but one of the things that we did to, because um, we want to be able to tell the story to show that this is equitable for all parties involved. Not just us, and not just the employees, but all parties. So I can take the story and tell it to somebody else and have it be viable for them. They might have different priorities and different needs, but if I can tell them a financially viable story that everybody's kept whole in this process, like we're not asking the legal team to take a discount on this. We're not asking the accounting firm to give us a discount. We're, everybody's getting paid. And that's, I think, the most important thing. Everybody needs to get paid. Because if everybody doesn't get paid, then someone's getting sacrificed and then the, the system breaks down. So in our case, we wanted to make sure that the, that, uh, the owners, us, got paid properly, fairly. Um, but we didn't want to necessarily saddle the business with extra debt right out of the gate um, based on potential. Like, for example, we don't do certain things. We don't, we don't do delivery right now. Delivery was always built in as one of the key components for a business like this. I don't think you'll find a pizza place out here that doesn't deliver. Um, uh, and we chose not to. As owners, I chose to not implement that because I didn't want to distract our, our service levels. I didn't I want to keep our quality up, and I didn't want to get into that. I was willing to sacrifice profits to do that. But that doesn't mean the business can't do that. I chose not to do that. And as a cooperative, we're actually, on Monday, we're going to be meeting with um, a delivery firm, DoorDash, um, which we think is probably the premier one in the area, the one that's most viable for us, to look at that. Because now, as general manager, my goal isn't necessarily to fulfill my specific needs. It's how do we maximize the business with the people. And we're doing this collectively. So we have four people meeting our guys and meeting with them uh, to meet with them to talk about the issues of delivery for our business. And, and, and what that can mean for our business, because that is another revenue stream. But I didn't want to saddle that expense or cost into a sale price. So what we did is we did kind of like a performance uh, clause or a contract, which basically says that every dollar over whatever the run rate is that you agree the business can handle based on current debt service, that it will share in that revenue with owners for five years. We picked five years are you know, fairly arbitrarily. Because we don't want it to be like forever. But we want to be able to say, look, we're not gonna, we think the business is worth this. Right now, the business is worth this based on revenue. But we think there's this delta in here that is real. Just because it's not being used right now doesn't mean it's not real. So we want to capture that value, but in a way that doesn't impact the business unless it has the revenue. So as it ha gets the revenue, it peels off part of it to basically compensate the owners for that, ex for that cost. And we, that was something, again, 
we control this as a, as an organization. We decide how we're going to do the cooperative structure. You can do how whatever you want. You can choose not to do that. We chose to finance it internally. Um, and so I, I, I'll go, I, have, I, have a, I have a slide on that next. How many worker owners are you? How many? Uh, we're 13 right now. Um, so we have some criteria to be a worker owner. Yeah. You have to be with us uh, 12 months and a minimum of 1,200 hours. And you have to have on schedule 25 hours a week. We consider that full time. It's not technically full time, but we call it full time to be a member of the cooperative. So 25 hours a week on schedule and basically 12 months of service, minimum 1,200 hours. Um, but do, do they have to meet certain other standards or how do they get voted on? Or? So once you meet that criteria, you qualify uh -huh. to apply for membership. If you're going to apply for membership, um, there is a, we require a super majority of members to vote somebody in. So to join the club, you need at least 75% plus one approval of existing members. Okay. So we want to create the bar fairly high to get into the co-op. And then uh, once you're in, you're in. Because whether you've been there for three days or three years, you have the same rights and privileges as anybody else. Um, so the criteria are 12 months minimum of 25 hours, and what was the third? So 1,200 hours. 1,200 hours. So for example, you could be with us 12 months but work one shift a week. That doesn't qualify. You have to have a minimum of 1,200 hours worked here and 12, 12 months. So it's, a, it's, it's, a, it's an and, not an or. Plus, you have to be scheduled 25 hours or more a week. How does someone leave? Uh, so there's no, this is not a contract. Um, there is a membership agreement that you sign, and there's certain. We basically define that you have a, a two-year time horizon. If you're going to be a member, if you need to kind of give us a two-year commitment, and that doesn't mean it's like a, a a commitment that you can't leave for two years. But the membership agreement to be a member costs. Oh, there's another criteria. You have to pay. Oh yeah, you have to three three thousand dollars. We had we had a three thousand uh, dollar membership fee. A membership fee, we have payroll deduction, so you basically can pay um, for over a two-year period. We give you two years, so it's it's like twenty something bucks, a twenty-six bucks a week or something like that, um, out of your check. Um, and you you know you can pay it all at once. There's no benefit. You don't get any discounts or anything. You can pay it all at once. Um, now we made for founding members, which are the members that were the first ones within the first three months of conversion. We actually made it a little you know, five months of conversion. We took a little bit of time. Um, we waived uh, what we called the minimum. Um, uh, well, we had a minimum de minimum deposit of that membership is seven hundred fifty dollars. So we waived that, and made it a hundred dollar minimum to make it less of a barrier, um, and we also uh, waived uh, other voting because the only the members at the time were me and my wife, and we basically pre-approved all people that qualified. So even though people didn't necessarily join. We automatically approve them. Should they want to join, they could join. So we, we pre approved like 18 or 19 people, for example, that were qualified. Again, you have to have a certain number of tenure with us, a certain number of hours before you qualify. So we, so anybody anybody could join. They don't have to get voted in. We already kind of voted those, those folks in for the initial ones. Future members now have to come up with $750 as a down payment on their membership. With what? 750 $750. Down. And then down payment for their membership, and then um, annual or weekly payroll deductions for up to two years, uh, and then it, it gets down to like I don't know, it's like twenty bucks or eighteen bucks a week or whatever it is for two years. You get paid off at any time. Um, the catch is and there is a catch because to me there there needs to be some level of ownership in this process and some risk. If, without any risk, you, if people get something for free, there's no value associated with it. So we ask people for a two-year time horizon. If they want to leave with before that two years, like say in six months, that seven hundred and fifty dollars is kept in the business. They forfeit that. That is a, that is their commitment. If they stay the two years and they leave, they get all their membership back, three thousand dollars back. All of it comes back to them. But if they before that, seven hundred and fifty of whatever they've contributed, they might have contributed two thousand dollars, but seven fifty is given back to the business as kind of you know, it's the way it goes. You know, we've invested time in you and, and you chose not to, that's fine, but we're retaining 750 When you and your wife retire, somebody needs to take your, your place though, as manager. Uh, I, I missed the first part.
first part of the question? When you and your wife retire. Okay, when we leave. Yeah. You need to replace your management. Right, so the general management position reports to the board, and the board would hire the general manager. Yeah, absolutely. And that is the manager of the business. No tip. Tip, it's a salaried position. Uh, yeah. And the board is the 13th? No, no, the board is, there's a three member board. There's a three person board. Um, I am one of those board members, and I've negotiated as part of the deal. Uh, I have a board position for five years. And then we pick five years is because basically, you know, before I let me get, hold, let me hold, hold on to that one for a second. Um, I'm just going to go to this next little slide is the fun one. So we, we have this little fun little slide of what happens when you sell, right? You got um, two people, happens to be my wife and myself. Um, there's some money involved, uh, and we have um, employees and or somebody that wants to buy it, and uh, we have a business. So you, you come up with uh, a price. So you agree on a price, and they usually have a bank that finances stuff, right? So there's this kind of relationship between the new buyers or owners, the business, and the bank. And then we just get, you know, the, and, the, and the people get paid. That's typically, right? What we decided to do is we decided to self-finance. We decided to finance the transaction. I'm not a big fan of banks. I'm not a big fan of owing stuff like that. So by us controlling uh, the entire process, we could be very, very flexible. So we could define the note how we wanted to. We could define payback terms as we wanted to. We're not going to foreclose on anything. If, if the business is, is struggling one month and is late on a payment, um, it was very, very flexible. So you know, we're the seller, we're the financers, and I'll, technically we're part of the buying group too because we're buying into this as well. We're members as well. So we had complete flexibility in defining all this. Now there are other things that do that. You can um, go to a third party bank and there are some banks that support or cooperatives, right? There's a, I think there's two in the area. There was one up in Oakland that we spoke at once. Beneficial State Bank. Yeah, yeah. I, think that, 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 I think we spoke, that was, is that in Oakland? Yeah. Yeah, that's the one we presented there at one time. Um, so there are ways to get around that, but there's there's additional flexibility. And, and, and this is a real note. It says we, we did a, what we do a competitive rate. We, we did a 6% um, loan um, on the financing for the business. Uh, that's paid out of business profits. We actually also did a um, working capital loan to fund the business so it has operating capital because um, you can't sell a business with money, it's just money. Um, so we financed that at 3%. All these loans can be paid back ahead of time to where there's no penalties or anything like that. Um, we're not trying to hold that over anybody's head. Is We want five years of return on this investment. We're happy to uh, take two years on that or whatever. If, we, if the business is great and wants to pay it off, that's awesome. Um, but that allows this to be a real message that you can take to somebody else because others can, can see, okay, well, I'm not giving the business away, uh, it's a transaction, and I'm getting paid for interest on the money that I'm taking risk on. Um, and by being part of this, by us being part of this, we're part of the solution that's moving this forward. So it gives some continuity as well. So um, our funding, uh, you know, we put the bank out of the process, we have our members, which are uh, owners of the new business. We're still um, get, uh, members, but we're also getting paid by that. And then there are assets that are owned by that. But the bank is, is kind of cut out of that, kind of cut out of that process. You don't have to do that. But again, I don't like all these legal documents that you don't if you don't have to have those, especially to banks which are very non-forgiving. Did you consider a credit union as a funding source? Same difference. Really? To me. Oh, okay. You could. And they could they could they could take the note and go find they could say, here, here's three hundred grand. We just got a loan from the credit union and we're paying down that six percent note with our credit union and maybe they offer I don't know what they offer. But I don't know if it's gonna be better than six percent on a business loan. Um, uh, business loans go from at the time six to eight and a half percent, sometimes more. So we try to pick the low end of that. So we want to be generous about that. wherever we can. We want to be on the lower side of things, the more conservative side uh, or, or, or aggressive side, depending on how you want to look at it. Um, but we want to be uh, uh, err on the side of, of, of deferring to equity to the to the team. But it's still fair. 
I mean, six percent, six percent. That's not a you know, it's not chump change. It's not it's, you know, it's a, it's, a, it's a reasonable expectation. If you could invest your money, get six percent return. It's a pretty good investment. So it's I think it's it's reasonable, but it, for what it is as a um, uh, as a business loan, which is basically what it is, it's competitive. So we want to be competitive and, and realistic. We didn't want to like be, make a bunch of gifts, but that's not a story you can tell to anybody. Um, so how are we doing? So this is you know gets to how are we doing? So again, we have a four-member board. Uh, we have one non-member, so we actually have uh, we have three members that are on the board and one non-member. So Patty, who's part of Project Equity, she's our treasurer, but she's a non-member, so she's non-voting. Um, so initially, the board got assigned, a appointed. We appointed a board of people that were interested, and we appointed uh, um, uh, two members uh, to be on the board with me. And oh, and oh, the reason we picked um, five years for the board term, the length of the note. So while there's financial impact or or risk to the owner, the owner has uh, a more aggressive stake in the controlling of the business to make sure things don't go off off the rails. There are also some mechanisms in there. If um, customer sat goes way down, if financially uh, the bank account doesn't stay at a minimum level, owners can jump back in as financial control and make immediate decisions, immediate corrections if something uh, is not being done uh, or, or somehow something goes all, all out of route. We want to make sure there, were, there wasn't a legal um, hurdle to take immediate corrective steps if there's something that needs to be done. So we, we and it, but for the most part, the business is, is, it is a functioning cooperative and runs that way, but in extreme conditions, should that happen, while the note is being paid off, um, the original owners have control to make uh, certain corrective measures, not, not sweeping ones, but certain ones that affect the financial performance because that directly impacts their ability to pay the note. Right? Um, so again, we have a, a treasurer who's an officer. That's a different than the board. So sometimes the board treasurer and the board and a, and a company treasurer are the same. We are not the same. The same with the secretary. The, sec the board secretary is different from the company secretary. So we have two members that are officers of the company that are not on the board. Um, there's a president GM, also an officer. That's that's me. Um, board meetings are every six weeks. We might move those down to quarterly, so they're not quite as time consuming. Um, uh, we have we created a, a committee, the Finance and Employee Benefits Committee. That when we for the first time we now have a PTO policy in our business. We implemented it in January because of this committee. Um, so we have a sick time and PTO policies that were implemented because of this committee. What's PTO? Uh, pay, pay time off, vacation time. We've never offered that because um, vacation time is you're on the hook for that. I mean, once you give it, you can't even if when you leave, you gotta pay it out if they haven't used it. So it's a liability at the business campus. Business has never had that before. Um, we also are looking at quarterly uh, bonuses, which we used to do something called employee wellness that we give quarterly based on certain sales performances. We're now looking to offer that when we stopped that as of July 1st when it became a co-op because that was a decision that, that we made as, as owners. Uh, but now as a co-op, that is no longer in play and we're now looking at how can we do that based on company performance, how can we pay quarterly bonuses because they tend to, they really like that quarterly bump. Uh, that uh, everyone is invited to all meetings. Members are seeing all the details before, and um, uh, this is the probably the toughest thing is people's free time. They're here. This is hard work. This is manual labor. This is you're working for you know honest living here, right? These guys are working hard, and when they have free time, their free time is is, is theirs, and we don't want to.